Great to be here today. Never been in this place. Thought I was in the wrong on the wrong street when I drove by. <laughs> but I see there was already a warm audience, so that's great. So uh, welcome to Darwin Day. Uh, of course, I, I wasn't aware it was Darwin Day until when I had the call several months ago. Um, so I have two things to do this afternoon. First is to uh, tell you about the work uh, in the field of cell biology that led to an understanding of how things move around inside of cells and how that uh, is linked to the ability of cells in our body to ship things outside of the cell. So all of the cells in our body, or most of them, make protein molecules. These are the little machines that catalyze the chemistry of life. And uh, on average, about 10% of those proteins are designed to be shipped outside of the cell by a process that's called secretion. And you know about the molecules that are secreted from cells. They're all very important. Insulin, something you know a lot about. Uh, all the proteins in your blood, lipoproteins. I'm sure, looking at the audience, you all know what your LDL levels are. <laughs> LDL is a particle that's... Uh, made in the liver, and it's secreted outside of the cell. And it shares the same uh, causeway, the same pathway that, uh, that insulin uses, although insulin is made by different cells. In fact, here's a cell that makes insulin. It's called the beta cell in the pancreas. Uh, you know that uh, diabetics, particularly type 1 diabetics, uh, are deficient in the production or secretion of insulin. Insulin is stored in these little granules. You see these little dots? These are condensed forms of insulin that are packaged into a membrane. Uh, a membrane, which you'll see in a minute, is, uh, consists of lipids and proteins. And these are little carriers, kind of like capsules. And it's the manufacture of these capsules and the directed movement and targeting of these capsules or vesicles to the cell surface that is what allows insulin to be manufactured inside the cell and then shipped outside of the cell. So I'm going to give you a tour uh, at a kind of a basic level of cell biology through the cell. And I'm going to spend some time talking about a real pioneer in the field, a man who won the Nobel Prize in 1974, a guy by the name of George Pilati. Um, here's George. He's no longer with us. But he did his pioneering work, uh, for the most part, at the Rockefeller University. And he used a machine an instrument that uh, he's, stand, he's sitting be behind called the electron microscope, which is basically a fancy microscope that allows one to peer into a cell and to see structures that, are, uh, that you can't see uh, with a light microscope. And so when he developed the tools of uh, the electron microscope, he, he had to find his way to capture images of cells that would uh, give some confidence that it was looking, what he was looking at were, 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 were real things. Because in order to see things, you have to, in the electron microscope, you have to shine a beam of electrons on them, and that is going to destroy any normal part of the cell. So you have to fix it with chemicals that uh, make it resistant to electrons and allow you to reflect off of dense things and not off of uh, uh, transparent things. And so that's the image that you're going to see that I'm going to show examples of is that focused beam of electrons scattered, scattered by particles. The first particle that he discovered is a ribosome. The ribosome is a crucial machine in all cells that is the uh, building, it, it, it's the machine that builds uh, proteins. It stitches proteins, one amino acid after another, together. And it was Pilate in the 1950s who discovered the ribosomes and showed the, what their role is. And I'm going to point to examples of that as, uh, in the next few slides. But I want to take a step back to tell you about some work that was done by other people uh, that led us to understand how membranes, these uh, carriers that, are, that encapsulate things like insulin, uh, what they look like. Membranes consist of several molecules. These red molecules are lipids. They're greasy. They're hydrophobic. They have a surface that faces the outside of the cell or the inside of the cell that is water-loving or what's called hydrophilic, and they have an interior that consists of fatty acids. You've heard of that. They're in our diet. We manufacture them. They're very uh, water-hating or hydrophobic, and they occupy the interior of this membrane structure, which is referred to as a bilayer because there are two layers, 
of lipid molecules that uh, are organized in this way. Now, membranes are unique because they have unique protein constituents, and these are depicted by these green things here. Uh, proteins uh, can often be embedded into the membrane, so they have some uh, water hating or hydrophobic character that allows them to associate with membranes. And they catalyze many of the, they, they create many of the features that, that define a membrane as unique. They are, for instance, transporters that will allow small molecules to flow selectively into a cell or out of a cell. Or they're receptors. Uh, this may be a receptor molecule. For instance, when insulin is secreted, it acts on tissues uh, that allow uh, glucose to be taken up and stored and the way this works is by insulin binding to a receptor molecule. And that, once it's bound, triggers a signal in the membrane that allows the cell to change its metabolism to now take up glucose that you've just ingested in your diet. OK, so now let's look at the machinery that Pilate uh, understood. Uh, and I'm going to tell you just very briefly about how he went about doing it and what his monumental achievement was for which he won the Nobel Prize. So uh, here's a, car a cartoon that kind of clearly delineates the, the myriad membrane compartments that are in a cell. Now, they're not just little capsules, but they're a whole bunch of membranes. Uh, you all know about the nucleus. That's where the genes and chromosomes are located. And in a cell like this, which is an epithelial cell, such as the cells that line our intestine, um, these cells are manufacturing lots of things that get secreted into the gut. And they have a, a, an elaborate network of membranes that surround the nucleus. And this network of membranes is called the endoplasmic reticulum. Oh, I'm just going to abbreviate that, ER. Uh, this uh, is a kind of a conveyor belt-like mechanism that has lots of ribosomes organized on its surface. And these ribosomes are busy stitching amino acids one after another, making proteins that are eventually going to get through the maze of organelles within the cell and be secreted to the cell exterior. Another important organelle that was found by a 19th century Italian cytologist by the name of Camilla Golgi is called the Golgi apparatus. And this was a real mystery membrane in a cell until Pilate did an experiment that I'll tell you about that put the Golgi apparatus in the center stage of this process of secretion. And there are other organelles. This is the mitochondrion. This is the organelle that makes much of the ATP. ATP is the energy currency in your cell. So when you have a, um, a meal and you digest the food and glucose gets taken up into the cell, glucose eventually gets broken down into its constituent carbon units, for the most part in this uh, powerhouse organelle, the mitochondrion, which turns the energy of carbon bonds into high energy that built into this a battery-like molecule called ATP. And so cells live and die by their content of ATP. There's also uh, an organelle that is a kind of a digestive organelle of the cell called a lysosome, where things get taken up and degraded into amino acids and sugars. So imagine yourself um, in George Pilate's shoes in the late 1950s, and you've perfected a technique to fit, chemically fix a cell embedded in plastic, and then use a diamond knife to cut a thin sliver right through the cell, you put it under the electron beam of the microscope, and you're greeted with by these, you know, in this enormous complexity, and you, you, you really at that point can't imagine how these things interrelate or whether, you know, what they do. I mean, they're just things that you see in the microscope. So uh, I'm going to take you through these uh, different organelles, and then I'm going to tell you what Pilate did to figure this all out. So here is now a, a close-up. This is a real electron micrograph of this uh, elaborate network of membranes called the ER. Um, in a cell that, for instance, in your liver or in your pancreas, that's where the cells are just busy churning out proteins for secretion. This membrane is an, has an enormous surface area. It's like a huge kitchen table, really. And, and it, the, the surface area of this um, organelle is vastly exceeds the entire surface area of the outer limits of the cell. And that's because it's, it, it's set up uh, to, to house these ribosomes, these black dots that you can see, that are busy stitching amino acid after amino acid, making proteins that are pumped, at least initially, into the lumen, this electron transparent interior uh, of the endoplasmic reticulum. 
So it cr these proteins cross a membrane and then they fold up in this compartment, which um, although it's still physically inside of the cell, having crossed a membrane, these proteins are, as you'll see, topologically outside of the cell. They are away from the cytoplasm and this is the first step in a committed path that they take to escape from the cell. All right, the next is the Golgi apparatus, which was first revealed by a special histochemical stain developed by this really brilliant Italian cytologist, Golgi. And uh, this appeared in all kinds of cells and nerve cells, but nobody, nobody really knew what the, what the hell it did until Pilates' experiment. Finally, uh, at the very end of this line of events, uh, there is a granule. I've, you've seen these before. This is uh, you know, similar to an insulin-containing granule. And at the very last step, when insulin is ready to be discharged outside of the cell, the capsule, or the vesicle, touches the outside surface, the cell surface, the plasma membrane of the cell. And the two membranes, the membrane that surrounds this granule and the membrane of the cell perimeter, physically merge, the lipids mix and these membranes become contiguous such that the inner content of the vesicle becomes now the outside of the cell. So remember I told you, when something crosses a membrane, even if it's deep inside the cell, it's already now topologically committed to being expelled from the cell. And that is how it's executed by this process of membrane fusion. Okay, so I've taken you through these organelles in this steps in which they participate. But it was really the following experiment, which I'm just going to summarize, of uh, Pilates that um, figured it all out. What he did was to, to, to devise a way uh, to uh, uh, add radioactivity to proteins as just as they are made using carbon-14. And he could then, using basically a photographic emulsion, onto which he put these thin slices of cells, see grain tracks, just in a few minute incubation, that were characteristic of proteins that had just been deposited here. And he could take tissues that were exposed to carbon-14 amino acids in an initial brief incubation, and then with time, he could see the radioactivity move from this compartment to this compartment, and eventually to the cell surface uh, to be secreted outside of the cell. So he could temporally relate the stages in this process using a combination of radioactive isotopes and electron microscopy in a way that had never really been conceived before. Now I skipped over something I want to return to just very briefly, and that is the process that I've just described works uh, in the pancreas, it works in the liver, but it also works in our nerve cells, even though those cells aren't actually secreting a lot of proteins. But nerve cells uh, are secreting lots of chemicals. They do so uh, to transmit uh, information from one cell to another. So when nerve cells touch each other, or if they touch a muscle cell, they have the ability to transmit information in the form of chemical neurotransmitters that you all know about, serotonin, which affects mood, or dopamine, which is deficient in Parkinson patients, major one is called acetylcholine. These are chemicals that are pumped into other kinds of carriers, these little vesicles here, and um, at the junction between a nerve cell and a muscle cell, shown here, these vesicles congregate, and when the nerve cell is stimulated by um, an electrical impulse, these vesicles discharge their content, dopamine or serotonin, whatever the nerve cell happens to be, into the gap between a, a nerve cell and a muscle cell or two nerve cells. And these chemical neurotransmitters uh, act on the opposing cell by binding to a receptor, which uh, then triggers the nerve impulse to continue. In the case of a muscle cell, it causes that muscle cell to contract. So every time, every, every simple movement that we take involves literally thousands, likely millions of these contacts between nerve cells and muscle cells. And the amazing thing is that it's a process, as you'll see in a moment, that is uh, exactly, essentially exactly the same in nerve cells and in pancreatic cells. That is, the machinery that does this is, uh, is conserved. Okay, so um, 
So that's the history. Um, when I started my laboratory at Berkeley in, in 1976, I had just actually um, heard Pilati give his Nobel lecture in, in a meeting in San Diego, and I was inspired uh, to try to dig deeper to understand uh, how all these amazing uh, events could be coordinated at the molecular level. So I've given you a what might be a descriptive pathway, but the implication of this complexity is that there are probably dozens, hundreds of molecules, proteins that organize this, that are responsible for moving proteins across a membrane or packaging them into vesicles or allowing the vesicles to fuse with the target membrane. Just that one snapshot image of a cell implies that there's an enormous complexity that needs to be understood eventually at the molecular level, and that was the challenge, how to do that. Now, the traditional um, organisms and cells that one used to study this, which Pilate used, were not really amenable to uh, molecular analysis. And so my colleagues and I, particularly a, a brilliant first-year graduate student uh, who joined my lab right from the outset, Peter Novick and I, decided to uh, try to study this process in a really simple eukaryote, a simple cell uh, that has a nucleus, uh, but where one could actually apply molecular, powerful molecular techniques, particularly genetics. And that, or that organism is uh, Baker's yeast. You're all familiar with Baker's yeast. Here's a cluster of yeast cells. Yeast cells uh, grow in, the, in, uh, in a simple defined culture medium. The way they grow is they send out a bud. They don't divide in half, Baker's yeast at least. They send out a bud, and the, the bud, the surface of the bud, grows during the course of about 90 minutes until it's about equal in size to the mother cell, at which point it divides, and the two cells continue to, to do the same thing. The mother sends out a new bud, the bud grows into a mother and sends out a bud, and this goes on doubling very rapidly. So it's enormously simple to grow these cultures and to have large populations of yeast cells. And so um, people who were interested in studying molecular mechanisms were increasingly turning uh, to Baker's yeast because of this facile application of, uh, of molecular techniques. So um, Novick and I decided to look inside of a yeast cell. And at first glance, it's a little disappointing, certainly not as dramatic as the section that you, sections that you've seen before. It's kind of crowded with dense granular stuff, which turns out to be ribosomes. But there are organelles. Here's the nucleus of the cell. Um, here is a tubule of endoplasmic reticulum. We know that because it's got conveniently the label ER. <laughs> um, and then there are even Golgi membranes. Um, you'll just have to take my word that we put these labels on for good reason. There's a dark staining structure, which is uh, called a vacuole, but it's the yeast equivalent of the lysosome. So it, it, they have all these organelles. And the reason that um, there's, there's sort of sparse in yeast cells, it turns out that secretion is very efficient. So it goes so rapidly, it just takes five minutes for a protein to be synthesized and secreted by a yeast cell. It goes so fast that the intermediates just don't have a chance to build up. So that turns out to be a big advantage for the reason, for, for reason that I'll show you in a moment. So here's our thought. Um, when, we, when we inspected the cell, we saw in the, under the bud portion of the cell a cluster of small vesicles, uh, similar to the granules that house insulin. Um, but they're pretty sparse. But Novick and I thought, well, maybe these vesicles are responsible not only for secretion of things outside of the cell, but that the membrane of the vesicle would be the building block to enlarge the plasma membrane, the surface membrane that surrounds the bud and allows it to grow and eventually to be, become the size of the mother cell. If that's so, if these vesicles are there for constructing the cell, not merely for secreting proteins, then any mutation, any genetic hit that the cell uh, suffers that cripples a protein, a gene and then a protein that's required to make these vesicles or to deliver them to the bud will kill the cell. So that means that those are, the prediction is that they'll be essential genes. Now, if you think about it, that's, that presents a problem. How do you study an essential gene? If you want to make a mutation and kill the gene, 
I'm going to grow the cell up. It's going to be dead. So you have to have a special trick. And the, the trick that people who work on microorganisms have used for decades is the following. Sometimes when you cripple a protein by making a simple mutation in a gene, you change just one amino acid in that protein. You know, proteins can have thousands of amino acids. And big mutations that kill the gene, kill the protein, sometimes lop out big chunks of the, of the gene, and so the protein can't function. But sometimes, if you introduce a mutation, it will just cause one amino acid to change. And sometimes, that one amino acid will render the protein unstable. Not dead, but unstable. And one form of instability is the following. Sometimes these mutations will permit the cell to grow, let's say, at room temperature, which is a cell that's perfectly compatible with yeast cell growth but not to survive at body temperature, 37 degrees centigrade. Another temperature where normal yeast cells grow perfectly well, but where mutant cells that have this crippling mutation will not grow. So, so one looks for mutations that allow a cell to form a colony on a petri plate at room temperature, but, will, but which will not allow a colony to form when the petri plate is transferred to a warm incubator at 37 degrees. Temperature sensitive lethal mutations. Really a classic way of studying those really important essential genes. Okay, so Novik and I, mindful of this, decided to just make a big collection of temperature sensitive colonies. It's really trivial to do this in yeast. You take a culture of yeast, you expose it to a chemical that causes mutations, and you um, pour the cells out onto a petri plate at you know, high dilution, and you grow the plate at room temperature, and if you s seed the plate with a small number of cells, after a day or two, you come back and you see dots on the plate constituting clones, colonies of cells. If you take that plate that's got these cells that grow at room temperature, you can invert the plate and just blot it onto a piece of filter paper and uh, lift the plate back up, put it back on, the t on, the, on, the, on your desk, put the cover back on, and then take a fresh plate and uh, make a kind of a photocopy, a stamp on the filter paper. And where the plate lands, a few, colon a few cells that were on the original plate will eventually be transferred to the fresh plate. So you lift that up, you mark, you mark it uh, so that you know the orientation compared to the original plate. You put a, its cover on it, you stick it in a, an incubator, a warm incubator, body temperature, and you come back a day later. And you look at the two plates, you line them up, and the original plate will have all the colonies. But occasionally, if you look at the other plate, they'll, most of the colonies will still be there because most cells will not have acquired this kind of crippling mutation. But occasionally you'll see a plate, a plate that has a blank spot where the original colony was. And you know instantly that you have introduced a mutation into an essential gene in that cell. I mean, it seems trivial, but it really is actually quite profound. You can you instantly know that you've crippled an essential gene. And now the task is to understand what that essential gene does to make the cell survive. So what we did was we made a bunch of these, a couple hundred of these, clones that are temperature sensitive. And we asked among them, are there any where secrete, proteins that would ordinarily be secreted now stay inside the cell? And the first one we found looks like this. Amazing. One of, one of the great moments in my career is when I went down to the microscope and saw this instead of this. We saw a cell that at the body temperature can't grow because all those vesicles that would normally be uh, you know, consumed in the bud are spilling over and filling up the entire cytoplasmic uh, content. So this cell eventually dies, uh, basically, of constipation. It can't secrete. <laughs> and you can show that secreted proteins now are building up inside the clear interior of all these vesicles. So this was, uh, this was very exciting. We published our, uh, our results. And we went back and we repeated this over and over and over again using uh, various techniques to uh, isolate as many of these different kinds of mutations that would produce this effect as we could. And uh, after a year and a half, we were able to identify a couple of dozen genes that is implying that at least two dozen different proteins acting at different stages in the cell are required for yeast cells to secrete their proteins. 
Um, another kind of phenotype that we saw in looking inside the cell was this one. Uh, remember we saw a picture of this Golgi apparatus in a mammalian cell, but remember the yeast cell, the normal yeast cell that I showed you was really kind of, you had to use your imagination to think that there was a Golgi, but you didn't have to use your imagination with this mutant because at, the, at body temperature, this cell, as it's uh, failing to grow, now builds up an enormous structure that is essentially, like, essentially equivalent to the Golgi structure. You don't need a G label here to know what this structure is. And finally, we saw other mutations that give this effect. Remember I showed you little thin, kind of uh, uh, poor excuses for an ER membrane, but not in this uh, mutant. In this mutant, the ER membrane becomes uh, huge. It, it wraps up large bits of the cytoplasm. It's much wider. The, the nuclear membrane is, is extended. And so we found a bunch of genes that cause secretory proteins to build up really early in the pathway. Now I'm going to jump over a lot of analysis to, to show you a, um, a cartoon that is the pathway that we were able to establish using uh, genetics and, and uh, the techniques that I've described. And the pathway you know, it looks pretty much like what I showed you Pilate demonstrated in the pancreas, but crucially, what we, could, what we could demonstrate is that at each station, there are a whole bunch of very specific genes and thus very specific proteins that are required, that are the nuts and the bolts of each step in this pathway. And I want to tell you just about one, because it's um, pretty interesting. The very first one, the one that gave this the startling result, sec one, when we cloned the gene, and, and sequenced it, you know, figured out what its predicted amino acid sequence was, it didn't look like anything. I mean, you know, some big protein. But in the succeeding years, as the genomes of higher organisms, particularly of mammals, were sequenced, this gene, this yeast gene, turned out to be everywhere. It's found in all eukaryotic organisms. Indeed, the protein product of this SEC1 gene is right at the synapse where uh, uh, neurosecretory vesicles carrying neurotransmitters are responsible for discharging their content into the synapse between the nerve cell and the muscle cell. So uh, one important lesson, not surprising, that we learned is that this fundamental pathway evolved over a billion years ago. And when you evolve something this complex, and it's useful for a yeast cell. It's going to be useful and, and, and exploited over and over again uh, in all subsequent uh, generations, to the point where it's even used for secreting small molecules and not proteins, in, in, for example, in the brain. All right, well, let me tell you just briefly uh, a bit about what we've done subsequent to this uh, elucidating the pathway. Um, so. I'm actually trained as a biochemist, and I felt all along that in, in order to really understand how these proteins work that we discovered, we'd have to have some way of putting them back together in a test tube, putting them together with membranes to see how they actually work chemically. What, are they, what reactions do they catalyze? And the, way, the best way to do that is to break the cell open and to isolate proteins and structures and see how they interrelate with each other in a way that can be manipulated more easily than when you have to work on, on an intact cell. And so one of the big achievements that we made about 15 years ago was we were able actually to isolate one of the vesicles that mediates traffic between two stations in this pathway and to study its chemistry. And ultimately we've been able, in collaborations, to obtain uh, an atomic resolution picture of some of the proteins that are re required to create vesicles by a budding process where they literally pinch membranes uh, in the form of little vesicles from, a, from, from the ER. And here's an example of a, of a structure of some of the proteins that we discovered. They, they, they actually make a cage in the cytoplasm, a cage-like structure that uh, folds around the membrane and pinches the membrane away from the ER to create a vesicle that can then carry proteins to the next station. So the triumph of this initial genetic analysis was our ability to focus on specific genes and very specific proteins, to isolate the proteins, and then to discover, using chemistry, how these proteins act uh, with each other to promote this pathway. 
Now, um, I, let me digress for a moment. As we developed these uh, observations, um, I was always, I've always been driven by wanting to know how a cell works, what, what, how it works, and so I wasn't particularly interested in applying this. Maybe I'm just not a practical person, but fortunately, there are practical people out there. And the biotech industry grew up in the Bay Area just around the time we were doing our, our work. And uh, a local company called Chiron decided to try to exploit the fact that yeast cells use the same pathway as mammalian cells to secrete proteins. And they were, um, with, with some assistance for me, able to harness yeast cells to manufacture human insulin. Now, yeast cells don't make in insulin. They have no need for insulin. <clears throat> but if you take the gene for human insulin and you put it into a yeast cell, that yeast cell can be fooled into manufacturing uh, that protein. And now one third of the world's supply of uh, insulin used in treating diabetics is made by secretion in yeast in a way that simply wouldn't have been possible if one relied on pig pancreas uh, to make insulin as it was done for, for, for many decades. And this all comes, I would say, from an investment in basic science. So one of the main things I want to leave you with is <laughs> the importance of basic science and its application by in the private sector. Now, we've also, uh, in recent years, been able to apply our knowledge to uh, human diseases because it turns out these are essential genes in yeast, and guess what? There are mutations that turn up in human beings that cripple these proteins in quite unusual ways. And one disease that we've worked on is a rare craniofacial disorder that was discovered by a clinician in Saudi Arabia in a Bedouin family. These kids have facial, dis oops, facial dysmorphism. Um, they um, get cataracts. Uh, their, the fontanelle, the soft spot in the top of their head, never closes. So they're quite brittle, but they survive. And uh, we were able to culture cells, skin cells, from one of the kids and uh, one, of their, one of the parents. The parents are perfectly normal. And then have a look by electron microscopy to see if we can see anything wrong with these cells. And sure enough, it was quite dramatic. Here at the top is a thin sliver through a normal skin cell. Here, this is this ER that I've been telling you about. In the mother, one of the mothers, it's where, where there was no disease, there's some distortion of the structure, but it's not bad compared to normal. But look at the kid. This is amazing. The kid's skin cells was enormously distorted. The ER is bloated up into these balloon-like structures, really more, more dramatic than even the, uh, the original yeast mutant. It's amazing that these kids survive, and we've been able to use our chemistry to understand exactly how this mutation uh, affects this process. So we continue. Now many, most of the people in my lab are working on aspects of this problem in mammalian cells where there is some interesting physiology and disease. But again, we're, we're always focused on the, on the basic process. And uh, work was going swimmingly well until um, October 7th uh, when I was rudely awakened in the middle of the morning and my life hasn't been the same. Um, when I got to the lab, they were all, they'd all donned mustaches. Uh, to, to and here's a snapshot from that morning. Now, if I have a few more minutes, uh, I, I want to I digress into another thing that actually I ha does occupy a lot of my time, and that is uh, what scientists do to publish their work. I mean, it's great that we do these things, it's exciting, it keeps us going, but we have to publish our work. We have to put it out in places that people read and value, and uh, this has been a real problem uh, because the, the biomedical field industry has grown enormously, and yet, uh, biomedical scholars tend to want to publish their work in only a very small number of venues. These are the journals Nature and Science and, and Cell, some of you may have heard of. Uh, and these are journals that are largely commercially driven. I have nothing against commerce. I, I think that's great if they make a good product, but, but as a result of their commercial drive for profit, for selling magazines, they impose artificial restrictions on the number and scope of papers that can be published. And you heard in the introduction that uh, many times they will rely on papers, on uh, attracting papers that are going to generate a lot of citations. And so work that could be very original, some of our original papers wouldn't have, wouldn't have been highly cited uh, at, at first. So most the most original work suffers uh, through an inability 
to be accepted and published in these so-called high-profile journals. Now this has introduced enormous distortions in the field that, that I've taken on, taken on myself and, 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 and I'm attempting to, uh, to address, and I'll tell you in the next few minutes what the problem is and what we're trying to do about it. So the problem is, as I've said, scholars increasingly demand publication in these venues. And a magazine like Science Magazine publishes only 50 pages of science a week. This covers the whole world and all of science. It just isn't possible the way that they rely on a print magazine to accommodate uh, all the great science. Science, as a result, accepts only 6% of the papers that are submitted. <coughs> Nature only accepts 8% of the papers that are submitted. So a lot of people are frustrated. A lot of people uh, push as hard as they can. And I fear some people cut corners and may misrepresent their work in an effort to get it into these journals. And now I'm going to show you something. Unfortunately, you won't be able to read it, but I'm going to tell you the, 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 um, the upshot of this. This is a document in Chinese. I've had it translated multiple times. That was issued by the Chinese Academy of Sciences last year, offering scholars, Chinese scholars in mainland China, basically a financial bribe if they succeed in the lottery in getting their work published in Nature, Science, or Cell. So that, that's shown here. You can't see this, but I can assure you it's true. <laughs> Irrespective of the work, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you're doing, if you manage to get your paper into one of these small, very restrictive venues, you will, uh, you will be rewarded what amounts to $33,000 personal income. There are some Chinese scholars who are successful at this game, and over half of their income comes from these bribes from the Chinese government. So imagine you're a young scholar, and you're, you want to make your name in China, and you want to get ahead. You realize that, that the only way that you could do so is by getting your work published in these few venues. Imagine, imagine the pressure, not just the pressure to work hard, but the pressure to cut corners, the pressure to misrepresent, the, the pressure really to manipulate data. This is really a serious problem, and it's a problem that we see now in getting some of these papers uh, and the work to be reproduced. And let me give you an example, a classic example that was, uh, was shocking to, to all of us and continues to be shocking. Several, and you probably heard about this, several years ago there was this uh, unbelievable, I mean really, it was unbelievable, <laughs> paper published in Science Magazine with the claim that a, a, a brine bacterium was uh, growing uh, with arsenate in its DNA in place of phosphate. So you may know that the DNA molecule has a backbone that has phosphate in it. Arsenate uh, is uh, chemically similar, uh, but but, but different enough that it was hard to imagine that the DNA molecule could have arsenate replacing phosphate in the backbone. Nonetheless, this paper was published with great fanfare, a press conference by NASA, you know, front page New York Times, thousands and thousands of citations of this paper generated for Science Magazine. Only the problem is it's not true. And anyone who was a knowledgeable microbiologist looking at this paper saw exactly why it was flawed and why it was not true, and why the paper should have been retracted. But years later, it still hasn't been retracted by Science Magazine, even though it is patently false. And I could cite many other examples in these high-profile, high-pressure journals. So this is a distortion. It's a distortion of science. I think it, 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 um, uh, it, is, it, it dishonors the, the, pub, the public's belief in science and, and the, more importantly, the financial commitment that you as taxpayers make to science. So scientists know this. They even publish editorials on, on these problems in the very journals that are offending as far as I'm concerned. I wrote to this author and I said, you know, the simple, the simple solution is don't publish in Nature. He never wrote me back. <laughs> so. Uh, many of us have gathered together in an initiative, uh, a petition, to the extent that these things are useful. It's an initiative called the DORA Initiative. It's a declaration of research assessment, which you can go online and see. Um, it was in the auspices of one of the scientific societies, which I'm a member. And it basically called on scholars, on review committees, on universities, on granting agencies, and even on publishers to eschew the use of citations in the form of a number called an impact factor 
in grading journals because this introduces an enormous distortion into the whole into the whole system. Well, another thing aside from complaining is to do something about it, and that is to create journals that are openly accessible. You heard about this movement, open access. Open access is a movement that um, uh, that allows you as readers outside of the university to have access to the literature. If you want to, if you read a New York Times article on some new discovery that's published in Nature magazine, and you want to dig deeper and go into nature, guess what? You can't do it unless you belong to the university, unless you're willing to pay something like $30 uh, for access to that one publication. This in spite of the fact that you as a taxpayer paid for that research for the most part. It, it really, it's, a, it's enormous uh, distortion that's based in part on the, on, the, on the business plan of these journals. The open access movement seeks to defeat that by having other sources of income to publish, but allowing all publications to be instantly and universally accessible to everyone, irrespective of your position in life or position with respect to a university. And one of those uh, open access journals that I, I'm the editor of is called eLife. Uh, if you Google eLife, you'll find the journal. You can read any of our papers. You don't have to pay anything. And our business plan, which admittedly is a, is a, a, a fortunate one, is that we have benefactors, three very wealthy organizations, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, the Max Planck Society, and the Wellcome Trust have gathered uh, their considerable resources together to fund this journal. And so anybody who wants to publish in this doesn't have to pay anything. They, they send in their work, we'll review it, we're selective. If we publish it, we'll publish it, and you then, as a reader, can read it. No, no one's charged anything because these funding agencies have decided that it's their role now to ensure uh, a high-quality journal that is openly accessible and uh, available to the scholars uh, regardless of their financial situation. So I'm uh, happy to talk about this journal, but let me just uh, close by saying um, uh, Berkeley has been a wonderful place for me. Uh, I've had a great life here. I really enjoyed the, the journal. Um, we've been very selective in our of what we publish, and I have to tell you that sometimes we have to reject papers. And sometimes authors are not happy when we reject papers. Even open access journals have to reject papers. One, one such paper was, that I rejected was, was written by the famous scientist uh, James Watson, who, <laughs> along with Crick, discovered the structure of DNA. Now, any, any of you have heard uh, Watson speak or know about him, he, he's a, kind of an outrageous character. And he, he didn't take kindly to my rejection. And in fact, he's gone around giving public speeches where he takes me to task for having the way I treated his, his paper. And here's the last slide. Um, at a meeting of the American <laughs> Association of Cancer Researchers, he said, I hate the editors, and he specified me in particular, of these journals more than I hate Republicans. Now, you know, in Berkeley, that's really a pretty dirty insult. Uh, I know both Republicans in Berkeley. And, uh, I know myself here. So, uh, so I, in my own small way, I'm getting back by showing this slide everywhere I go. 